Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Today we're continuing our How to Snowshoe series. We're gonna be talking about the snowshoeing specific equipment and clothing layers you're gonna need when you get out on those winter trails. So from our last video, we had planned our snowshoeing trip. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about the snowshoeing specific equipment and the clothing layers we're gonna to wanna to be taking with us. And we're gonna start by talking about the snowshoes themselves. And there's a couple fundamentals that you need to understand about snowshoe options, because as with any other type of gear, there are trade-offs. Now, fundamentally, we wanna match our snowshoes to our weight and to the type of terrain that we're gonna be covering. Now every snowshoe is gonna have something called its max recommended load. Now max recommended load is the total amount of weight that a snowshoe can take bearing down on top of it and still adequately distribute that weight across its surface area, keeping you floating on top of the snow. You should be able to look up the max recommended load in the product specifications of any snowshoe that you're gonna rent or buy. Now max recommended load is meant to entail the total weight on the snowshoe. So that means your weight the weight of your clothing and boots, the weight of your pack, the weight of everything inside of your pack, really the total amount of weight. So think about how much you're gonna weigh when you're fully geared up and look for a snowshoe that can handle that amount of weight. Now, the way that a snowshoe can handle more and more weight is by getting bigger and bigger, by increasing its surface area. So there are two downsides to increasing surface area. One is that the bigger the snowshoe, the more awkward it is to walk with. But the other is that the bigger the snowshoe, the more the snowshoe itself weighs. And having extra weight on your feet isn't a small deal. There's been a number of scientific studies, not the least of which has been done by the US Army, that demonstrate that one pound of weight on your feet is roughly the same as five pounds of weight on your back in terms of efficiency in carrying. Now they've looked at a number of different metrics. They've looked at calories consumed. So think of that as the total amount of energy that you're using. They've looked at oxygen usage and they've looked at heart rate. And all of these bear out, you know, within the margin of error that yes, in fact, roughly five times more difficult to carry the same amount of weight on your feet than it is on your back. If you think about it, it makes sense. The weight on your back is close to your core and requires very little stabilizing. It also doesn't move up and down much with each step. Each step that you move with your feet, you have to pick up and put down and swing out and push back. And so you're moving weight a lot in a cyclical motion away from the core of your body, using more energy, using more oxygen, using a higher heart rate to move that oxygen around. So lighter snowshoes are gonna make for a more enjoyable snowshoeing trip. So when we're talking about terrain types, we're really talking about two subcategories of terrain. One is the snow itself. Do you have powdery snow or do you have hard and icy snow? And the topography. Do you have flat land or are you walking on hills? Powdery snow is going to be less demanding on your traction types and flat ground is gonna be less demanding on your traction types. To understand what types of snowshoes work best and what types of terrain, we really need to understand how snowshoes are put together. We're going to start by focusing on the frame. Now, there are old style, you know, wooden frames. There are now new style foams. No one really uses wood frames anymore. And foams are really specialist frames and they're not particularly durable. So we're going to focus on the two remaining types of frames. The first being an aluminum tube. You can see we have this aluminum tube that runs around the outer. This allows you to make a very light snowshoe because you can place very light materials to make up the rest of the surface area here in the body. And then the second would be these composite frames, composite plastics. Now, these are a little bit heavier, but also a little bit more rigid and sturdy. So what you end up with, with aluminum tube frames, again, is a light snowshoe that works really well on powdery soft snow. Your snowshoe is lighter, that means a little less weight to sink down in the snow, it means you can create greater surface area at less weight cost, but you also are going to bounce this outer tube off of hard snow. So think of these tubular snowshoes just like you would a pontoon boat. Incredibly light, therefore cheap to make, easy to use on really steady water or really steady soft snow, not so good in choppy water or in rough choppy snow. 
Now the composite frames are the opposite. They are stiffer, they are more rigid, they're going to be slightly heavier and slightly more expensive generally, but they're also going to allow you to do more diverse things with the traction on the underside of the snowshoe. So you're going to be able to handle a more diverse set of terrain. So understanding frames and what types of traction they can accommodate leads us to considering the traction themselves. Now, every snowshoe is going to have a toe and instep cramp on or some means of grabbing the snow and pushing yourself forward as you walk. But then snowshoes are also going to have things such as heel cramp ons, and that's to create some stability as you're moving downhill. These have these braking bars. Now, what you can see here on these composite snowshoes are the side rails, and you're typically not going to see any side rails on aluminum frame snowshoes because there's no place to put them. And just like with tires on a car, the wider that you can push those side rails to the outside of the snowshoe, the more stability you're going to get when you're moving on a side hill. So you can see these are pretty close to the outer edge of the snowshoe frames, and you can get snowshoes that actually the frames themselves make up the side traction. Now beyond the traction, we want to consider the binding. And there are two basic types of bindings. One is a rotational binding, which allows your foot to rotate across an axis that moves underneath the ball of your foot. And the other is a fixed binding, which offers no rotation. Now the benefit of a fixed binding is that it naturally conforms to your normal walking motion. So you're going to see this oftentimes in kids' snowshoes where they just have a fixed binding. And the reason for that is that you can pick your foot up and it stays on plane. So you have no tail drag. Tail drag is when you pick up your foot, your tail drops, meaning you have to pick up your foot higher in order to clear your step moving forward. You also really can't walk backwards much at all. As you pick your foot up and the tail drops and you try and move it backwards, you've now created a snow scoop. All that snow is going to push against the tail of your snowshoe. So you're going to have to pick up your foot very high to move backwards. It takes some practice and getting used to to do that. Now the benefits of a rotational binding and why you typically see it in more advanced snowshoes is that it keeps your foot in a very natural position when you're moving on hills. If you imagine that I'm moving uphill here and I have my foot in a fairly natural flat position, I now also am keeping the body of my snowshoe and all of this traction engaged on the snow, making it a much more stable platform to walk on when I'm moving on hills. Now, along with the bindings come binding closure types, or how you're going to connect your boot to the snowshoe. Well, now, you're thinking about binding closures. In my mind, there's really three areas to consider in terms of trade-offs. One is the stability of your boot within the binding. That is, how much play side to side or forward and backwards are you going to get as you're moving uphill, downhill, across the sides of hills. The second is how easy is the binding closure to use with gloves. And then the third is how packable is that binding closure or how flat is it going to lay. Now that third category, how packable is that binding closure, is really only going to matter to people who use snowshoes in route to other types of activities. So for me, that's mountaineering, that's climbing peaks, and so it's something I need to consider because I'm oftentimes strapping my snowshoes to the outside of my pack, and they need to be able to pack down flat and securely without getting caught on things when I'm doing technical climbing. For those of you who are just doing snowshoeing as a one-off activity to go out and come back, you really don't need to consider the packability of your bindings as much as you need to consider the other two components, that stability and how easy is it to use with gloves. Now there's almost as many binding closure types as there are snowshoe models. So I'm just going to compare and contrast two common types of closures so that you can see how these three areas of trade-offs play out in reality. So we're going to take a look at these Tubbs Flex Alps and these MSR Lightning Ascents. Now you can see that the tubs have a toe cap. There is no toe cap on the MSRs. Now that toe cap is going to allow, as you're moving downhill, for you to have that pressure on the toe of your boot, which is usually the hardest part of your boot, distributing that pressure and weight across the toe. Whereas moving downhill on the MSR with no toe cap, it's going to be these straps that are going across the forefoot that are going to keep your boot from sliding forward. And so you're going to have a little bit more pressure on your forefoot. And some people could find that potentially uncomfortable. You could also see that 
there's a webbing material running through a semi-rigid frame here on the tubs. And so that is not going to be particularly packable. It doesn't fold down and lay flat if I were going to strap this on the outside of my pack. These MSRs lie very flat. I can flatten them completely and put straps across the outside of my pack keeping these snowshoes nice and tight and compact against my pack when I'm doing something potentially more technical. These rubber straps are also very easy to grab with gloves, uh, although pulling on them can be a bit of an arduous process. Whereas on these tubs, you see that most of the adjustment mechanisms are sort of a two-part system. I have to lift up and release latches in order to pull and tighten both across the forefoot and here on the back of the snowshoe. Now these are actually fairly easy to do with gloves, but they're not as easy as simply grabbing a strap. So you can see that you get this continuum of ease of use with gloves, this continuum of packability, this continuum of stability across different angles of terrain, depending on how your binding closures are constructed. Now, one last thing to consider when you're thinking about the construction of snowshoes are ascension bars. If you're on extremely hilly terrain, these ascension bars can be flipped up on the heel of the snowshoe and allows your boot to ride on that bar, keeping your foot in a more horizontal plane as you move uphill. That bar is going to make your calves burn a heck of a lot less if you're going uphill an awful lot. As you're moving on flat terrain or downhill, you simply flip that bar back down. Now, not every snowshoe is going to have ascension bars. So if you're going to be doing a lot of hilly terrain, I highly recommend finding a snowshoe that does have that ascension bar. Now that you understand more about how snowshoes are put together and what makes them better or worse for different types of terrain, don't go getting analysis paralysis. So first of all, I wouldn't worry too much about snow conditions. Snow conditions change. They change based on humidity, they change based on temperature, they change based on how well traveled a particular snowshoe route is. I would really spend most of my time thinking about how hilly or mountainous are the regions that I'm gonna be snowshoeing in. If you're in the mountains of Colorado or the mountains of California, you're probably gonna be doing a lot of uphill, a lot of downhill, a lot of side hill, and you're gonna to wanna to consider things like ascension bars and having side rails that push really to the outer edges of your snowshoes. If you're snowshoeing mostly, say, in the Great Plains, yes, there are gonna be rolling hills, but you're generally gonna have much more level snowshoeing environments. If you're in urban areas, and you're gonna be snowshoeing in the park, even more so. So really, I would just be considering mostly topography, and only in the extremes, the snow conditions that you might be experiencing. Another piece of equipment that can really impact your stability while snowshoeing are poles. Any of you who are skiers know that using poles can really help your balance, but even more so when you're snowshoeing. You're physically putting those poles into the ground at each step. So should you trip on something, you can kind of lean on that pole, hold yourself upright. But as with everything that we talk about, there are trade-offs. Some studies have shown that using poles actually increases energy expenditure. If you think about it, that makes sense. We talked about how having weight on your feet uses more energy than having weight on your back because you're swinging that weight out and pulling it back in with every step. Well, same thing if you put the weight at the ends of your arms instead of the ends of your legs. You're putting that pole out and you're hauling it back with each and every step. It's also something to grip. And I've had some people who overgrip their poles complain about getting tired thumbs and tired forearms. You can mitigate that with proper technique, but yet another potential downside. Also, your hands can get colder because they're out, they're up, and they're away from your body as opposed to, say, in your jacket pockets. So those are all three things that you may want to consider when you think about the downsides of using trekking poles. Now, that being said, the upside of balance, but also the upside of perceived difficulty. Those same studies that showed you're actually using more energy also showed that people almost universally feel like they're using less energy. They don't feel like they're putting in as much effort, and that's because they're distributing the effort across their body. It's not just your legs that are propelling you. Your arms are now helping you. So you're using less than maximal effort across multiple muscle systems in your body. So while you might be using more calories, you're not going to feel like you're burning your body out as quickly. I personally do use poles. I use it because I have some knee instability, but I also just like the feeling of distributing that work across the wider set of muscles in my body as opposed to just in my legs. Now, if you do decide to use poles, you're going to want to get poles with snow baskets on them. Now, if you're using a ski pole, they're already going to have those baskets. If you're using a trekking pole, you're going to have to buy these baskets as a separate accessory. 
Now, these do exactly what your snowshoes do for your body. That is, keep whatever they're attached to above the snow. You don't want to drive that pole down through the snow where it becomes basically unusable. It's down by your knees or your ankles. You want to be able to push off it. So that snow basket grabs the snow and keeps that pole up above it where you can push off and use it for stability. Now, when it comes to trade-offs between ski poles and trekking poles, ski poles are going to be cheaper and more stable because they're one long piece. But that one long piece also means they're one length, and that's going to limit their effectiveness when you're on hilly terrain. When you're on hilly terrain, you want to have shorter poles when you're moving uphill, so you don't have to pick your arm up to put the bottom of the pole in ground that's above your feet. That's going to save your shoulder muscles. You want to make the pole longer when you're moving downhill, so you don't have to stoop over to plant the bottom of the pole in ground that's below your feet. That's going to save your back. And when you're on a sustained side hill, you can have a longer pole downslope of you and a shorter pole upslope of you, again, so you don't have to reach down or you don't have to reach up to get your poles planted in the ground. Now, if you do go with adjustable trekking poles, you can vary things like grip type, whether or not there's shock absorption, but those are really considerations for the warm months. In the winter, I really only consider how the poles collapse. And there's really three types of collapsibility. One is sort of a tent pole type. It breaks into three components that you then fuse back together and then extend to lock into place. That's gonna be a pole that shrinks down to the smallest possible proportion. And those poles can typically fit inside your pack, which may be a consideration if you have young kids who eventually get tired of carrying their poles like ours do. And you can place these in your pack rather than having to carry them around awkwardly as you're finishing up your snowshoe. Now, if you don't get the tent style poles, there are two types of telescoping poles. Telescoping meaning that they stay in one plane, but just move in and out of separate tubes. Now you can have these flick lock type closures where you open this flap in order to release the locking mechanism to adjust the pole. Or you can have twist locks where you twist the pole in one direction to unlock it and twist it in the other direction to lock it after you extend it. I find that twist locks are incredibly hard to use with gloves. The poles just turn in my hand. I can't apply enough force to grab onto the pole, hold it in place in order to make that locking mechanism unlock. So flick locks are definitely, in my mind, the way to go if you're going to use a telescoping pole when you're out in the winter and using gloves. So you've got your snowshoes, you've got your poles. What type of boots are you gonna need? Now, this isn't something that you need to overthink. Just about any type of waterproof snow boot is gonna be just fine. That being said, you can always find boots that are a little bit better or a little bit worse for the type of snowshoeing that you and your family are gonna be doing. So you should understand some of the trade-offs. And the first trade-off is around leather versus synthetic. There aren't a lot of leather boots out there anymore, but some people still have them. And one of the benefits of them is that they're incredibly cheap but they're also incredibly heavy compared to synthetic boots. And as we talked about, heavier weights on your feet do add up when it comes to energy expenditure. You also have to reapply a waterproofing material to them every so often. So there's a cost of ownership that comes along with leather boots that you're not typically gonna see with synthetics. Now with synthetics, you can now start talking about single versus double boots. Now, single boots are just what you would think of anytime you see a normal boot or shoe, and double boots are a liner that fits into that boot that you can also pull out. Now, a single boot is going to be good if you're doing a lot of what we call high output activities. High output just means kind of keeping your energy revved up. You could be going uphill a lot, or you could be going continuously without stopping. You're not really worried about getting cold because you're constantly moving. A single boot is gonna be just fine for those types of snowshoe trips because you're not really worried about your feet getting too cold. Now, if you're like us and you have small kids, you're often going to be stopping and that's an opportunity to get cold. So I do use a double boot. Again, a liner that fits within an outer boot. So not only do you have the insulation of the outer boot and the insulation of the liner, you also have dead space or air between the outer and inner boots, which is another layer of insulation. So you're gonna find double boots are a lot warmer when you compare them to single boots. Now, finding a double boot for kids can be a little bit difficult. We use these Chemic boots. Chemic is a Canadian company. We mentioned them in our top 12 tips for cold weather camping. And we've been really happy with these boots. Again, a liner that can come out, 
just like the big adult boots that I've got. And that's going to be really beneficial for the kids who stop a lot, have a lot of snacks, need a lot more water breaks. There's a lot more opportunity for kids to get cold. So if you can find a double boot for your kids, we highly recommend it. So another topic you heard us cover in our top 12 tips for cold weather camping were clothing and clothing layers. And we're going to cover some of that ground again today. Now, one of the things that we need to understand and accept when it comes to clothing in the wintertime is that the consequences of getting it wrong are a little higher than they are during the warm months. If it's the middle of summer and you're not wearing enough clothing, it might make you uncomfortable, but it's much less likely to become a health and safety issue than it is in the winter. Conversely, if you're wearing too much clothing in the summertime, yeah, you're going to start to get pretty sweaty, but when you stop, that sweat's going to help cool you down, which is what you want anyway. Well, in the wintertime, if you're wearing too much clothing and you build up a sweat, when you stop, that sweat's going to freeze and you're going to get cold, and that can start to become a health and safety issue. So we really need to think carefully about the clothing that we're going to be wearing when we're going out in the wintertime. And rule number one when it comes to clothing is don't wear cotton. Cotton holds moisture within it. So whether that's generating moisture because you built up a sweat or it's moisture because it's snowing outside, cotton fibers are going to hold on to that moisture and then it's going to refreeze. Now you have frozen crystals against your body and that's a good way to get hypothermic. So no cotton fibers in your clothing when you're out in the wintertime. And then rule number two, as we alluded to, is dress in layers. You want to be able to add layers to make yourself warmer and more insulated when you're stopping and resting. And you want to be able to take layers off as you get moving and if you get moving hard uphill and you're generating a lot of body heat. Having a lot of different layers that you can pull on and off is going to make for a more comfortable trip and keep you in that safe zone that's between sweating and feeling uncomfortably cold. So in our family, we use a three or four layer system on our bottom halves and a four layering system on our upper body. Now your legs don't need to be as well insulated because they're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of blood flow going to your legs and the muscles in your legs as you're doing the work of snowshoeing. Your upper body is a lot more passive and it also holds all of your important internal organs. And so you really want to make sure that you're keeping your upper body well insulated. You tend to get cold hands and feet when your upper body isn't being insulated enough, when your core isn't being insulated enough. Your body's natural response to your core being at risk is to stop the blood from flowing to your extremities. So if you can keep your core warm, you're actually gonna enable your body to let the blood flow freely to your extremities. So you're also gonna keep your extremities warm. With all that bearing in mind, that three or four layer system that we use in our bottoms starts with a base layer. Now, our base layers are gonna be either a wool or synthetic long underwear. And what we're really looking for is moisture wicking fibers. Again, we don't want like a cotton fiber that's gonna hold that moisture up against our skin. We want a fiber that's gonna pull any moisture that we might happen to generate if we get a glaze of sweat. We want it pulled away from our body and held away from our body. So a wool or synthetic moisture wicking base layer starts our layering system. Now, the second layer is a soft shell. Now, soft shell is stretchy and easy to move in, but it's also water resistant. Now, these two layers, the base layer and your soft shell, are going to be the layers that you're going to be in no matter what all day. So having some water resistance in case it's lightly snowing is an important attribute. But you also don't want it to be fully waterproof because the more waterproof a fabric gets, the less breathable it is. So when you're working really hard, your sweat is actually going to push against what is that vapor barrier of the waterproof material and be held in. And you're going to get kind of swampy underneath that layer and get overly heated. So a soft shell that's slightly breathable but also waterproof is a good way to go. Now soft shells can come with outlinings like these have, no lining on the inside, or they can come with some type of fleece or other lining. Now of course a fleece lining is going to be more warm. So think about that as your matching layering systems. If you have a thicker base layer, maybe you don't need any fleece lining in your soft shell pants. If you have a thinner base layer, maybe you do. Or if you're going to be continuously moving, you're going to be doing these high output activities, maybe you don't want a fleece lining in your second layer and you want to keep that breathability at a maximum. These are the types of things you want to be considered. Now again, if you only have water resistant materials, you're going to need some waterproof materials, and that's the third layer, a shell pant. Now, your shells are designed to keep 
you dry. So if it really starts snowing hard and the heat of your body is going to start melting that snow as it rests on you, you want a material that's going to keep that water from saturating your inner layers. Once those inner layers get saturated, you're kind of done for the day. So a shell material that's fully waterproof is layer number three. Now, that sort of optional fourth layer that we use is really dependent on the conditions and the type of trip we're going to be taking. If it's really cold, or if we're going to be standing around a lot, which actually happens a lot in our family because we have little kids and we do stop quite frequently, then you may want to consider a purely insulated pant. Now, this insulated pant would actually go over your second layer underneath your shell. So consider that when you're buying shell pants. You want your shell pants to be able to fit over all of the layers that are underneath it. So you might need to buy a slightly bigger pant. If you're going to be wearing three layers, base layer, soft shell, insulated layer, you don't want that shell compressing the insulation on that insulation layer. Compressed insulation doesn't leave enough air to actually do any insulating. So if you compress that material, it's not really doing you any good. So make sure that you're thinking about whether or not you will be wearing insulated layers and that you have shells that can appropriately leave some space around them. Now on our upper bodies, those four layers are gonna sound very similar. You've got a moisture wicking wool or synthetic material as a base layer. We like to make sure that our second layer has a hood and they can come in lighter additions like this is one of mine that is really made for, again, high output activities. It's got some water resistant on the upper shoulders, but it's also much more breathable under the arms. It's designed to keep me cool as I'm working really hard. Or a simple synthetic hoodie, as our kids often use in the cold weather months. Our third layer, again, a shell. And just like with the pants, you want to make sure that your shell is big enough to fit over all of the other layers of clothing. And non-negotiable for the upper body is an insulation layer. Now, sometimes this will be carried in our pack when we don't need it, but we always have it with us. And you are probably all pretty familiar with the trade-offs between down and synthetic insulation, but just in case some of you aren't, down materials like here we have in one of our kids' jackets are going to be much more compressible, so they pack down smaller. They're also typically going to be lighter for the amount of warmth insulation that it provides. Synthetic materials obviously don't pack down as small and aren't quite as warm for the weight, but what they do offer you is the ability to stay insulating when they get wet. When down gets wet, it compresses and it no longer provides any insulating value. Synthetic materials, when they get wet, will maintain some loft, and that loft is what's generating the insulation, it's that air trapped between the fibers. So synthetic maintaining loft when wet means that you still have insulation when it gets wet. Now beyond the basic clothing, of course, we're also going to need socks. And just like with everything else that we're talking about, layering socks is a pretty good idea. Now you don't have to, but it's really hard to change out boots when you're out on the trail. You probably only brought one set of boots. And so sometimes that boot is gonna to be too warm for the temperature. And if it's too warm for the temperature and your feet get sweaty, having only one sock on it, particularly if it's a wool or synthetic sock, is a good way to get blisters. So by putting on a thin undersock or liner sock, this one happens to be silk, but you can also get them in other synthetic materials or in wool. By having two socks, they rub across each other rather than across your foot. You're much less likely to get blisters. It's also a good way to keep you warmer if it's particularly cold out. So I do recommend a two sock system. Similarly to two socks, we also like to use two gloves or two mittens. Now, mittens, of course, are going to keep your hands warmer because your fingers are together. So the blood flow across your fingers are all kind of helping each other. Whereas in a glove, obviously your fingers are spread out and they all have to keep themselves individually warm, if that makes sense. But gloves are much easier to manipulate things with. So if you're doing something crazy like opening a snack or putting on your snowshoes, you're going to find that much easier to do with gloves on than with mittens. Just be aware that mittens are warmer. With our kids, we like to go with a thinner liner glove. 
over a bigger snow glove. The liner glove is smaller than the snow glove so that it fits inside. That way they can take off the outer glove and do finer motor manipulations with chapstick lids or whatever it might be without having to expose their hand to the cold. You can also potentially find gloves or mittens that come already modularized. So there's a liner inside of the outer shell. And sometimes you can find a glove liner with a mitten shell. That's an interesting compromise when it comes to the trade-offs between gloves and mittens. Just keep in mind that it's not going to be quite as warm as a pure mitten would be. Now you're also going to want to keep your face warm, and particularly if you're snowshoeing in the wind. And to do that, I like to use a neck gaiter. Now neck gaiters are incredibly versatile pieces of material. They're just a tube of fabric. You pull it on over your head, and then you can pull it back up over your nose and mouth and cheeks to keep your face warm. You can also pull the back up, back over your head, and now you've got a balaclava, keeping your ears and the sides of your face warm. So a neck gaiter is a wonderful piece of material to bring with you when you're out snowshoeing. And finally, we're also going to want a hat. Now you're going to want your hat to be able to pull down over your ears. So finding a hat that's got a nice fleece lining at the level of your ears is going to make it a lot more comfortable to wear, particularly if you're using wool, which can be a little bit scratchy. Again, you're going to want wool or synthetic, not cotton. Now the thicker the hat, the more warmth it's going to provide, but also the hotter you're going to get if you're doing a high output activity day. So for those days where I'm really on the move, a thinner skull cap is often what I'll wear, just enough to keep me from being exposed to the cold weather, but not so much that I can't breathe through it when I'm really generating a lot of body heat. Now for our kids, we like hats that have ear flaps because our kids are a little less conscientious about pulling hats down over their ears. So they can often get their tips of their ears pretty cold if they're not paying attention to it. So rather than struggle with that particular problem, we just mitigate that by having ear flaps on their hats. So there's always something covering their ears. One last piece of clothing you may want to consider is a leg gaiter. Now a leg gaiter goes under your boot in front of the boot heel and up the bottom part of your leg where it cinches down over the top of your calf. And it's designed to keep snow from getting in the top of your boot. You kick up a lot of snow when you go snowshoeing and getting snow inside your boot can be a real problem. Obviously your feet are going to be warmer than the snow, it's going to melt pretty quickly, and it's not long before you have saturated socks. If you have saturated socks, then you're not going to be enjoying your trip. In fact, your trip might be ending. So a leg gaiter might be a good way for you to keep that snow out. But there are other options. A lot of boots these days now come with an integrated gaiter. So here we can see we've got a double layer boot. We have this outer boot with the boa lacing, and we have this inner boot here that's a liner. But then we have this integrated gaiter that's taller than all of it, and it zips up over the top of the boot, and it's got elastic tension in the top, so it cinches over your calf. That's going to keep that snow from piling in the top of your boot. Now, if your boots don't have an integrated gaiter, you can also find pants that have an integrated gaiter. So these particular soft shell pants, if we look at the bottom cuff, it's got an outer material and now this inner material. And one final option, maybe some of you have pants where you've noticed these grommets at the bottom and wondered what they're for. Well, they're for putting a cord in, just like you had on the leg gaiter that I showed you. You would put this over your boot, under the bottom of it, and up against the heel, and it's going to tension and pull down the top of your pant leg over the boot and stop it from rising up. So should you plunge through a deep pocket of snow, it's not going to push the leg of your pant up and allow that snow to pile in. So another option would be simply use those grommet holes in the bottom of your pants or make grommet holes in the bottom of your pants. Tie on a piece of cord. I prefer an elastic shock cord, and you can use that to keep the snow from out of your boots. 
So that's the snowshoeing specific equipment and clothing you and your family are going to need. But don't feel like you need to buy all of this. You can rent it. Many outdoor gear shops, certainly many REI, will rent this type of equipment. And now there are online services such as Outdoors Geek or Arrive Outdoors that will mail gear to you for rent and you send it back to them when you're done using it. And a lot of these services will even rent the clothing. So don't feel like you need to pour a bunch of money into this just as you're getting started. Now, as we discussed, your terrain will dictate a lot of your equipment needs. So what terrain are you and your family interested in getting out into? Is it the mountains, the hills, the city parks? We'd love to see the diversity of locations that our community are using to enjoy the outdoors. Drop that in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please hit that like button. And our next video in the snowshoeing series around the ancillary equipment you're going to want to bring with you on that trip is coming out in a week. So if you want to be alerted to that video or any of Short Guys Betaworks videos, please subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, if you've got ideas for content you'd like to see, you can put those in the comments so that we can keep on helping you get more out of that big outside.